Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to the live program number 135 at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is distinguished faculty, Dr. Michel Pierre Bionon from Lyon, France. Dr. Bonin completed his residency from the University Hospital of Lyon, France, and practices hip, knee, and ankle replacements. He's the president of the French Hip and Knee Society and also the past president of the Lyon School of Knee Surgery, and currently serves as the board member of the European Knee Society. He's also co-founder of the Ganymed Robotics and president of Pixel Diagnostics. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Michel Pierre Bonin from Lyon, France, for a fantastic live program. Over to you, Dr. Bonin. Thank you for this uh, kind introduction, and I'm very happy to be with you sharing uh, our uh, concepts around uh, customization of implants developed here uh, in Lyon uh, in France. And it's really a pleasure for me to work with you. And uh, if we want to uh, understand uh, the limitation of conventional implants and to perceive the necessity to customize the implant, we have to uh, understand well the history of TKA. If you look at the, in the past, the first uh, ever artificial knee implant human being was implanted in, uh, uh, in uh, Berlin at the Charity Hospital in May 1890 by Themistocles Gluck. It was a prosthesis with a hinge prosthesis uh, made in, by Ivory. The first implantation was in a woman 17 years old who had the tuberculosis. Themistocles Gluck implanted seven cases like that all, uh, all failed and uh, Temis Klokles Gluck was fired from the uh, Berlin University. And, um, oh, sorry. Uh, and uh, uh, the first half of the 20th century was the era of the resurfacing. And up to the 40s, the resurfacing was made with soft tissue, mainly uh, uh, iliotibial band or surrounding tissue of the knee, which had quite good outcomes, uh, finally. And in the 40s, 80s, uh, 50s, after, uh, sorry, the discovery of the uh, chromium cobalt, that was called at that time the vitalium. It was a hard metal era with, in which the surgeon was covering, uh, resurfacing the distal femur with metal. And then in the 60s, it was uh, uh, still a resurfacing on the femur with polyethylene, on the, on the tibia. But all that period was purely resurfacing. There was no bone cuts, and we tried to reproduce the native anatomy of the knee. And it's when the, the modern TK was developed, mainly by Michael Freeman in uh, London at the Imperial College, it was the era of the modern TK. And the modern TK tried to be more anatomic, even if it was not completely anatomic, as you can see on that image. And there was a cylindrical metallic femur rolling on a, a, a plastic uh, polyethylene tibia. And uh, the, the, the implants were cemented and they were bone caps. And it was very quickly followed by uh, John Insole and Chit Ranawat in 1973, who launched the total condylar implant, which was the first real worldwide implant in the world. And this has been a great breakthrough because it's really the introduction of the modern TKA. And modern TKA began a, a mass product. And there were two main breakthroughs. First, a technical breakthrough, because the implant required bone cuts with dedicated tools to do a reliable uh, uh, preparation of the, of the bone. And also, the design of the implant were definitely carved into the marble with a fixed design. And this has been a great, uh, a tremendous progress, but there are some limitations. And the first limitation was a manufacturing limitation because it was very hard metal. It was a casted metal, mold metal, and it requires a mold which are very expensive in the industry. So uh, the uh, manufacturers always try to limit the number of implants and it has always created problems for surgeons. And the second limitation, it was because it was based on bone cuts. Bone cuts influenced the alignment, and we began to discover the uh, problem obtained due to uh, a malaligned uh, prosthesis. So let's begin with the design issue. Very few of us remember that 
the first decade of the total condylar implant, there was only one size for the femoral component. And John Insall apologized for that in this paper published in 1983. And this was a big problem. And, uh, and we paid special tribute to all these pioneers who tried to implant prosthesis just with one size. And progressively, in the, uh, in the, uh, between the 70s and the 90s, manufacturers in, in, in increased the range of sizes, but very progressively. At the end of the 90s, there were five or six sizes with big manufacturers. And in, in improvement uh, uh, of, the, of the range of sizes was proportional, assuming that big knees and small knees had all the same shapes, that males and women had the, the same knees, that African, Caucasian, and Asian had the same knees. And ladies and gentlemen, it's only in 2003, let's say yesterday, that we doctors understood that humans don't all have the same knees. And the, the first uh, real uh, um, scientific breakthrough was uh, published by uh, HIT in the GBGS in 2003. And he demonstrated that for a same AP dimension for a knee, there were various uh, mediolateral dimension. And some knees are large, some knees are narrow. And this has been a break, big breakthrough because it opens the door to more narrow implant. And many manufacturers at that period uh, try to, uh, to launch narrower implants to, uh, to avoid these kind of oversizing implants. But we quickly understood that it's an oversimplification to think only in terms of large and narrow because it's more complex than that. And we, uh, a few years ago, we uh, introduced the concept of the trapezoidicity ratio and we demonstrated that some knees are very rectangular and other knees are very trapezoidal. And that most of the uh, most of the standard prosthesis are too rectangular and create overhang on the on the anterior area of the prosthesis of the of the knee. And recently, it has been also demonstrated that the shape of the trochlea is very variable. And because all these variation with trapezoidicity and trochlea are all statistically independent, ladies and gentlemen, how many implants do we need? to fit with uh, the anatomy of the knee. Let's say if we look at that, if we need, for example, 10 variation of dimension, two width, one large, one, one uh, narrow, two trapezoidicities and two kind of trochlea. And because we have right and left uh, implants, that means that we should have 160 implants available in our hospital. And I don't know any manufacturer who could provide us all of that. And, uh, uh, and because of that, even with the more modern implants that we can have. You see, we are always compromising when we implant prosthesis because if we want to have the good mediolateral dimension on the distal area, we are undersized entirely. We are undersized sometimes on the trochlea. If you want to, be, to have a good bone implant fit on the anterior aspect, you are oversized posteriorly, et cetera, et cetera. And even with the most modern implants manufactured by the biggest company in the world, and as a result, with conventional implant, it has been demonstrated that the rate of overhanging can be up to 70%. It has been, it has been published by our team, but also by many uh, other, uh, uh, other authors uh, like uh, Mahone in, uh, the, in, in, the, in the United States. And we have demonstrated that there is a close correlation between the sizing and the residual pain. The more and oversized the prosthesis is, the more risk, the higher is the risk of uh, residual pain. And uh, when the prosthesis is undersized, there is a decrease of risk of residual pain. And this is the same for the range of motion. And the more oversized is the prosthesis, the less is the uh, knee flexion after one year. Another in interesting aspect of the uh, design discussion is the ready of curvature. When I was resident, I was fascinated by the, uh, all the discussion by uh, anatomists to know whether the human knee is multiradius or single radius. And I was fascinated by all these discussion based on anat anatomic investigation. But the truth is that some knees are multiradius and some knees are single radius. 
And if you look at this patient that I have operated in one single day, you can see that some are very uh, single radius and some are very uh, multi-radius. So it, everything exists in the nature. Uh, but the reality is that some total knees are multi-radius and some total knees are single radius, which, which is good. But as a surgeon, I use the same implant from all my patients. So if I implant a multi-radius prosthesis in a multi-radius patient, it's okay. But if I in, in, implant a multi-radius prosthesis in a single radius patient, it won't be very good and vice versa. So the alignment issue is also a, a very interesting debate because as I said previously, uh, the, uh, because of the bone cuts, we, we understood very, he very early in the 70s that if the bone cut is not in a good alignment, is in varus or in valgus, it, it's, the, uh, it, it's a source of early failures. And so the, the pioneers of total knees, Michael Freeman and John Hinsall, uh, decided together to promote what they called the neutral or mechanical alignment. They recommend to cut on the femur and on the tibia at 90 degrees from the mechanical axis. And they call that mechanical alignment uh, because, uh, uh, because uh, the cuts are perpendicular to the hip knee uh, ankle uh, axis, which is supposed to be a mechanical axis. But in fact, it's not a mechanical axis. It's mechanical only uh, on textbooks because in fact, it's, it's a mechanical if we apply the, the, the weight on the head on the femur and then the weight is uh, following the mechanical axis. But in the reality, it's not working like that because the weight is applied on the center of gravity of the body. And in dynamic walking, we all know that the dynamic axis is completely different from the static axis. So uh, it's a geometrical construction. The mechanical axis is a geometrical construction. It's not a biomechanical reality. And uh, in, the late, in the 80s, uh, the Baltimore School with uh, Angerford and Krakow uh, uh, remarked that in fact the, the joint line is not at 90 degrees from the mechanical axis but is tilted by three degrees and they described the anatomic alignment where the surgeon cut at three degrees of inclination of the axis and try to reproduce the uh, native uh, alignment. So it, it was a good step toward anatomic restoration but it doesn't pay account on the human variability. And it was still biased by the mean value medicine. You know, the medicine of the past where we consider that everybody should be put in the mean value for everything in cardiology, in orthopedics, in uh, endocrinology, in everything. Nevertheless, in the first 30 years of the TKA, the dogma was the neutral alignment. Everybody for everybody, we have to cut at 90 plus 90 to put the patient on 180. And this was the dogma. And if somebody uh, do not follow the dogma, he was uh, fired from his job. And many papers have demonstrated that it's probably not so bad. And you see the, the most quoted paper about that is a paper from Mary Ritter, many, with many publications who demonstrate you, when you look at the paper, you, you think that it's a good proof that the, the, the goal is to be at plus minus three degrees from the neutral alignment. So that, that has been published everywhere. But very few people look at the material and method of the paper. And when you look at the material and method of the paper, you can see that all alignments were measured on short film radiographs. So that means that it's pseudoscience. It doesn't mean anything because uh, we don't see the, the mechanical axis on short, uh, short film radiographs. So it's uh, not really a good, uh, good science. And surgeon quickly uh, understood that mechanical alignments had some limits. There are many limits. First, because native knees, very few native knees are following the rule 90 plus 90 equal 180. Knees are not like that. Many uh, knees are have a virus in the femur or a virus in the tibia or a valgus in the tibia. And if this patient, you do asymmetric cuts. And when you do asymmetric cuts, uh, then 
you don't restore the native architecture of the patient. You change the alignment. You distalize the lateral condyle. You change the joint line orientation. Then you change everything in the majority of our patient and it cannot work. And look at that patient, you see, with a constitutional tibia varus. You see in that patient, if you cut at 90 degree, look at the asymmetry of the resection on the tibia, it cannot work. And uh, it's even worse if you have a constitutional virus deformity because you resect much more on the lateral distal condyle than uh, uh, the medial distal condyle. And therefore it creates a lot of ligament balancing problem in flexion and in extension. Of course, because we are surgeon, we are very clever, we are very innovative, and we invented a lot of tips and tricks to address these problems. In the eighties, we understood that because we implant the prosthesis in a non-anatomic position, and because the knee envelope is non-extensible, we have to, to, to find some tricks. And the first tricks was to detach the ligament. It's a, 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 an easy trick and that we call euphemistically a ligament release, but in fact, it's a ligament disinsertion. Then in the nineties, because we understood that it's a little bit aggressive, we decided to change the position of the implant in the, in the knee envelope. And then we invented the concept of the external rotation, but it's just cheating with the anatomy. We externally rotate the implant just to, because it's a non-anatomic implant with non-anatomic bone cuts in a non-extensible envelope. And then in the 2000, we invented to change the coronal alignment, the coronal positioning of the implant. And we'll speak about that later. So due to all these uh, new understandings of things, there was a progressive evolution of the concepts in the field of, uh, of TTA. And first with the registers, with many uh, publication about the subjective satisfaction of the patient, you know, it's quite recent that we analyze the subjective outcomes of our procedure. Uh, but since we do that, we understood that our patients are not always very satisfied. And the rate of very satisfied patient of the TTA is very low. It's between 50 and 60%. Very few publications speak about the very satisfied. We generally group the very satisfied and satisfied patient in the statistics because it's better. But if you look at the very satisfied, it's not so important. In our series, it's 50%. So uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite low. And there is also a global trend in medicine in all specialty where we have understood that we have to switch from the mean value medicine to the personalized medicine to accept that we shouldn't put everybody or the human being in the same mean value. And many 3D investigation with CT scan, with MRIs, et cetera, are, have made us understanding that the human variability in alignment is, is great. And there are patients with a lot of, of, deform, of orientation of the joint line. Some patients have various on the femur and the tibia, some have various uh, on the femur and uh, valgus on the tibia, et cetera. So there are very, very uh, different way of uh, different morphotypes in the, in, the, in the humanity. And the big paradigm shift has been, uh, uh, is coming from this publication from Sébastien Parat. Sébastien Parat was, uh, is a French uh, surgeon. He was, when he was fellow, he, he went in the Mayo Clinic and he has been able to, uh, to follow and to analyze the patient of James Round at the Mayo Clinic. And the particularity of the patients from James Fromm were that they were all having long leg X-ray preoperatively and postoperative. So they compared the postoperative alignment of the long leg X-ray and to, to look at the survivorship. And they observed that the patient which were outliers had the same survivorship than the patient which were in the range plus minus three degrees. So it has been a bomb in the world of the TTA uh, alignment conception. And from that, all the conception have changed a little bit. And many surgeons understood that we had to switch from the 180 degrees for every patient to a, a more respectful surgery where we try to reproduce totally or partially the constitutional alignment. And look at that study. It is a very interesting study because it's a, it's a Belgian guy, Luc, 
who analyze the alignment, the post-operative alignment in a big series of TKA made by surgeons who were mechanical alignment surgeons. The goal of this surgeon was to restore the mechanical alignment. But in fact, in that, surgeon, in that series, he observed that the surgeon intuitively, unconsciously reproduced the native deformity of the patient. So it's, it's interesting to see that in the, in the 2000s, surgeon intuitively understood that we have to restore a little bit the native alignment of the patient. And after that, the epitome of this concept has been described by Stephen Howell in, uh, in the United States. It's what he called the kinematic alignment. And in the kinematic alignment, the, the goal is to implant the prosthesis in uh, accordance with the soft tissue envelope and with the joint line to reproduce as well as, as good as possible the native orientation of the knee. And it's based on a caliper technique where the surgeon measured exactly what he removes and he tried to remove exactly the size of the prosthesis he will implant. So uh, it's supposed to be quite an, uh, an anatomic uh, uh, surgical technique. So the, uh, 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 the, the kinematic alignment technique uh, create big hopes uh, in, the, in the world of, of TKA. But we must understood that it has also limitation. And there are some limitation of kinematic alignment and there are several limitations. And the first limitation is that uh, with that technique, it means that the implant position by definition is variable in some patients the, the prosthesis will be tilted by three degrees, in others by six degrees, by other, it will be tilted in the other direction by three degrees or et cetera, because we follow the native orientation of the joint line. But the problem is that if you implant conventional implant, it creates problem because standard TK are not designed to be positioned differently in each patient. And if you do that, it creates a lot, uh, uh, it can potentially create some problem. And it has been demonstrated, for example, by Charles Rivière, who has demonstrated that if you implant, for example, the personal prosthesis, you see, uh, with a, a, a kinematic alignment technique, that means that in many cases, you will have overhangs, overhangs on the trochlear, on the postural for condyles, and this creates uh, impingement and problem. It has been also demonstrated that uh, if you do kinematic alignment, because you cut on the posterior condyle parallel to the posterior condylar line. And because it's standard implant, that means that on the trochlear side, you, you implant the prosthesis in internal rotation, which can create problem. And uh, uh, the main limitation of the kinematic alignment is that in 2020, we still don't know what is too much virus. What is the threshold that we shouldn't uh, uh, trespass? Is it three degree? Is it five degree? Is it 10 degrees? In fact, nobody knows. And nobody knows for one very good reason, is that it's that uh, when we analyze our X-ray, we have absolutely no trick to differentiate the constitutional versus the arthritic deformity. When you have an X-ray, you have a global deformity, but it's very difficult to understand from this X-ray what is the part of the constitutional deformity and what is the part of the arthritic deformity? You know, the bone wear, the ligament laxity, the rotation, the loss of extension, and all that create problem. And in the literature, there is never differentiation between the arthritic deformity and the pre-arthritic deformity. And it changed everything because look at that patient. This patient has 16 degrees of virus. And it's a constitutional virus because it's a bilateral virus. The patient has virus since childhood and it is a bony deformity, mostly a metaphysical tibial deformity. And in that patient, if you cut at 90 degrees, you have a very asymmetric cut. If you implant a, a symmetric prosthesis, it creates problem. You will have a lateral laxity. You will be too tight medially. It will create problem. And obviously in such, and also you cut in very weak bone here. If you cut at, with a, a residual virus of five or six degree. You have a, a cut which is more anatomic. You remain in the good part of the bone, in the subcontrol part of the bone. You don't create so much uh, uh, asymmetry. And we can guess that in such a patient, having some residual deformity in the cut is good. Now look at that patient. 
This patient has the same uh, uh, global deformity, but it's a unilateral deformity. You know, it's an, uh, under control at first sight, there is no virus. The virus is due purely to a bone wear. So it's not a constitutional virus, it's a virus due to bone wear. So in such a patient, if you cut at 90 degrees, you will put a prosthesis which will fit the defect. So you correct the deformity. And so it's a, a, a corrective surgery. But if you cut in virus, it's a mistake because you will be in very weak bone here and uh, you create problem. So in that patient, a residual virus is not good. In the previous patient, a, very, a residual virus is good. And literature never make the difference between these two situations, just because uh, we don't have the preoperative good X-ray and we don't have a good uh, way to investigate that. So ladies and gentlemen, can we improve the process? To improve the process, we must uh, clear understand that the medical industry is very late, has always been very late compared with the general science and general industry. Look at the global science and industry. Look, in, in the 60s, we had satellites. We had man on the moon. In the 70s, we had spaceships, personal computers. In the 80s, the, 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 the computers were beating the uh, chess champions. We had internet. We had the International Space, space, space Station. In the 2000s, we had the digital revolution, 3D printing. In 2010, we have humanoid robots, and we have probes everywhere in the interstellar space. And now look, compare with what we have in orthopedics. Look, in, in the 60s, we didn't even have a modern TKA. In the 70s, we had modern TKA, but only one size. We had already, already spaceships, people on the moon. Then in the, in the 80s and 90s, we had three to eight size for TKA. In the 2000s, it, the period where we used CT and MRI and we understood that human beings don't have the same needs. And it's only in the last decade that we are listening at the patient voice, at the subjective result of our, uh, our, our procedure. So don't keep that in mind, the, 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 how late we are with the rest of the science and the, in the industry. And now we have a lot of new technology. We, we have machi quick machining, we have CT analy analysis, we have 3D printing instrument, we have, you know, we have so many things that we, have, we can change the paradigm. And it's the reason why uh, we began working on the concept of custom implants uh, in, uh, um, in 2012 uh, with a company based in Switzerland, which is a Symbios. And uh, uh, since 2018, we use regularly uh, custom, uh, custom prosthesis. And the, the, the goal of the custom knee prosthesis is to reproduce completely the native femoral shape, you know, in terms of size, in, ter in terms of radii of curvature, in terms of condyle asymmetry. We reproduce also completely the tibial asymmetry, the trochlear shape, and the, uh, the original alignment. And also we developed this technology in order so that it's accessible to all patients. It shouldn't be, you know, uh, an expensive uh, 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 high-level uh, technology uh, dedicated only for rich patients or for rich country. No, it should be accessible to all patients, uh, where, wherever it comes, whatever the, the, the kind of osteoarthritis. And the, the, the process, you know, is quite simple. We, uh, the manufacturing is based on uh, mainly on a CT scan and on X-ray. Then uh, we do a, a 3D uh, planning based on the CT scan. The manufacturing of the implant is a traditional manufacturing based on chromium cobalt casting. And then because we have many, many pre forms of prosthesis, the, the, um, uh, the customization is made uh, by a quick machining, you know, with five axis uh, machines, which work 24 hours, uh, seven days a week. And uh, the, uh, the custom instruments are made by additive manufacturing. Then everything is put in a single box, sterilized and sent to the hospital. And you see, this is the box where we receive everything. So we have all the, 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 the instruments, you know, which are custom instruments and the uh, definitive uh, implants which are uh, cemented and uh, for now, uh, PS. And this uh, concept of uh, uh, 
customization is a real paradigm shift because now we stop doing a pseudo planning on 2D X-ray with a more or less good quality. We do the planning from a CT scan with a 3D analysis. Then we have anatomic implants, which reproduce the native shape of the implant. And then the design is adapted to the alignment and vice versa. And uh, uh, you see, first we do a CT scan. And the, the, from the CT scan, it's quite easy to understand the, 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 the wear, or if, you have, if you have bone wear, and then to compensate that, to, to find from the CT scan, we have special algorithm for that, to, to find from that, the, uh, the, the, the pre-arthritic uh, axis, native axis on the femur and the tibia. And then the, the prosthesis is planned from that. So in order to reproduce the, uh, the, 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 the constitutional alignment of the patient. And then we define the orientation of the bone cuts and the inclination uh, uh, of the, of the polyethylene. And our rule for now, perhaps it will change in the future, but because we didn't want to, to to go into a dangerous adventure. We try to follow the accepted rule uh, in, in that field. So we decided not to cut the, the tibia and the femur with more than three degrees of inclination. And uh, we decided to have uh, no more than two degrees of inclination of the implants into the joint. And, uh, uh, and, and, and then, and, and also the third, the third uh, rule, you see that we want to have a definitive HKA between 175 and 183, no more than five, more than five degrees of global virus and no more than three degrees of global uh, valgus. So you see, uh, our planning is made from matrix. So we have matrix here with the femur on the horizontal axis, the tibia on the vertical axis, you see, with the definition of neutral uh, femur, varus femurs, valgus femurs from literature, and etc. And from this matrix, we, uh, we, we put from one single patient is constitutional alignment. And after that, we, uh, we do the job. So you see, for example, this is the series of patients we operated in 2018. Uh, you see, most of the patients had constitutional neutral femur and tibia, but we had quite a lot which were various on the femur, neutral on the tibia, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is in the, in the, in the article, so you can uh, find that in the uh, KSSTR article. And if you look at uh, our strategy, you see what we can do with the origin prosthesis, the, the custom prosthesis, is that if you look at the orientation of the bone cut, it's more plus minus three degrees. So it's the yellow area. And then we have two degrees more possible with the inclination of the implant itself, which is the orange here. here. And third uh, rule, we want to have no more than five degree global virus, no more than three degree global valgus. So in yellow here, this is our target zone. It is what we call the safe zone. So uh, if you have a patient who, whose native constitutional alignment is in the safe zone, we just reproduce it with the prosthesis. We don't change anything. We just reproduce the alignment of the patient. But if the patient is very far from here, if he has very severe deformity, because we don't want to take risk, we correct a little bit to join the safe zone. And this is our uh, planification matrix. You see, we have the, the target zone here. When the patient is in the yellow zone, we don't change. And if a patient is outside the yellow zone, we change it by keeping by preserving is native morphotype. For example, if a patient is varus neutral, we keep it in varus neutral. If the patient is valgus valgus, we keep it in valgus valgus. If the patient is neutral valgus, we keep it in valgus neutral. And we try to never cross the varus valgus line. That means that a patient who is constitutionally valgus aligned should never be pushed in varus align, alignment and vice versa. Because many studies have uh, proven that if you change the native alignment of the patient, you have uh, it jeopardize the uh, the satisfaction of the patient. You see, this is an example. You see, it's a, an example of our uh, planification. You see this patient. You see the the preoperative X-ray. Here you have the preoperative CT scan. Then you have the planning. Then you have the post-op X-ray. And here it's what we have done. 
You see, the patient was here on the pre-op X-ray. The pre-op CT scan was here. So we, we didn't accept that. We want to change to put him in the, in the safe zone. So we designed the implant and, de and planned the bone cuts to push the patient here in a safe zone. And finally, the patient was here. And this is uh, an, another example with, uh, with a valgus knee, you see, preoperative X-ray, preoperative CT scan, preoperative planning. This is the postoperative X-ray. And you see, preoperatively, the patient was here on the X-ray, here on the CT scan, which is the constitutional alignment. We, done, we do not accept that because all our studies have demonstrated that patients who have a valgus deformity are happy to be corrected and we don't accept more than three degrees of global valgus. So we plan to put the patient here and it's what we did. Thanks to the uh, custom implants and to the custom guys. And this is the series, uh, the global series. You can see it, it, it in, the, uh, in the publication uh, from uh, KSSTR, which will be soon uh, uh, in open access. So you can wait and you can have the uh, full paper in open access uh, uh, from PubMed. And you see this was the distribution of all our patients before the surgery and the pre long leg X-ray, you see here? And this is postoperatively. So we were able to put most of the patient in the safe zone. Of course, we were not perfect. I apologize. It was uh, the first series of ever, wherever we did that. Um, uh, so the technology was not completely, completely mature. So we have, we have failures. Huh? We have some patients who remain, you know, uh, outside of what of our target, which was the yellow zone. However, it's not so bad for the first year of uh, 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 of investigation with this new uh, technology. And uh, this is example, you see, this is a patient who have a severe valgus deformity, but the valgus here is mostly intraarticular, you know, due to the laxity, due to the bone wear, but there is no real constitutional deformity. And in that patient, we planned nearly to realign the patient, you see, with only two degrees of residual valgus, and it's what we did. You see here, uh, the postoperative x-ray, sorry, excuse me, Let's go back. This is the postoperative x-ray. And uh, same, you know, with uh, with a virus, uh, with a, a virus patient here, severe virus. Uh, a part of the virus is due to the arthritic remodeling, you no know, laxity, bone wear, rotation, loss of extension, etc. But apart also from the constitutional alignment, and in that patient, we planned to uh, implant the prosthesis with five degrees of remaining virus, and it's what we did. Did, and the patient is doing very well. And it's very easy because we know exactly what we are going to do and we know exactly what we're doing. And because the, the planning is a very comfortable way of doing because when you do the surgery, you have that, it's a good roadmap and you know exactly where you are, what you are doing. And if you have for a reason or another to do a recat, you know exactly where you are coming from and where you are going. You see, and it opens door for many other things. You see, this is a patient which has been multi-operated due to a tibial fracture with a, who had an infection of the tibia in the first, and uh, uh, I did a, a custom knee prosthesis, and it was quite easy because I don't need any, any more to violate the canal. I don't need to put guides. I don't. Uh, I just follow the custom guides and put a custom implant. This is another patient. It's a patient I operated in uh, Bulgaria. They invited me to operate that patient. But, uh, I felt it was a bit a trap. It was a multi-operated stiff knee in a young patient. And uh, it, it was not so easy, but thanks to the uh, customization of everything, you know, it's quite easy. And I did the, the, procedure, the procedure without uh, uh, terrible uh, difficulty. So uh, you see, as a conclusion, uh, I, I think that uh, customization uh, will open many doors, uh, will solve many problems that we have with TKA since the, the beginning of TKA. It helps to understand the prearthritic morphotype. It helps to reproduce the native alignment. It helps to reproduce the native intraarticular shape and to improve the ligament balancing and to improve the finally the uh, satisfaction and the, uh, the rate of residual pain and all the difficulty that we can experience now with total knee. And the, one of the main advantage also is that it makes surgery much more easier much easier because you don't have to deal with difficult situation intraoperatively. You don't have to think about the ligament balancing, about the rotation on the femur, the rotation of the, 
because everything has been planned preoperatively with dedicated custom tools on the CT scan. And uh, in my experience, it makes surgery much easier and much more uh, straightforward than in the past. And almost it's the direction we're going to explore here uh, in Lyon and with uh, other friends. And for now, we are quite happy with this, uh, this, uh, this option. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. A fantastic presentation. Absolutely delighted to see the great research that you're doing at your hospital in Lyon. Few questions. One is, yeah. how, what is the time taken to develop these implants once you take the, once you do the yeah. CT? That, that's a good question. For now, uh, be, when you have the CT scan and uh, the implant in your hospital, it's four weeks. Uh, at the end of the year, it will be six weeks. And the goal is to be at four weeks. But for now, it's eight weeks. Because we, we spend, uh, at the, the beginning, we spent a lot of time you know, discussing the planning with the engineers, etc., And also it must be uh, the, the implant are manufacturing from, um, from a ca specially calibrated uh, a CT scan. So the radiologist must, must have a good software and a calibrated CT scan to be able. And then the, 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 the DICOM image of the CT scan are sent by internet directly uh, to, the, to the manufacturer, which is based in Switzerland. And then uh, we don't lose time, you know, to, to send CD or things like that. It's just, or everything is done by internet. So well, the implants are imported from Switzerland, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. It's uh, all are manufactured uh, uh, in Yverdon-les-Bains uh, in, in Switzerland, in the French speaking part of, uh, uh, of Switzerland. And uh, it's amazing eh, because now in the plant, all the, you know, the, the, pro the, 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 the you can see the progress of all the chain and the, the machine are working 24 hours a day, eight, uh, eight, uh, eight days per week, uh, seven days per week. And it's, uh, it's uh, quite amazing to see that. And has COVID changed the scenario? Excuse me? The COVID, COVID, the coronavirus. Ah, ah, yeah, yeah, yes, uh, yes, a little so bit. Has it yeah. changed the scenario? Yeah, has it yeah, changed yeah. the logistics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has, it, uh, it has changed a little bit because there are many patients that were planned for surgery in uh, uh, in April uh, and March, which has been postponed. Uh, and generally we, we after uh, eight months or six months, uh, we consider that the anatomy may have changed due to the arthritic remodeling. So we order a new uh, implant. And um, the, the price of the implant after that depends probably on the, um, on the, on the on, from the, the health system from one country to another. But we are trying, the goal is to have the, the, the prices as a, the standard prosthesis. And in France, for example, the prosthesis is sold for the price of a conventional prosthesis. Because the, the goal is not, you know, it's what I said, the goal is not to make a high-tech implant for rich people. No, it's just to change the paradigm of TK, to, to really solve the, the problems of TK. Because we all know that TKA creates some problems, and the problems are due to, you know, to misunderstanding from the beginning and to manufacturing problems. And I think now it's the, the responsibility of our generation to, to, to address the real problem, not to change, you know, few things. Because in, in the past decades, we have invented tips and tricks, we are which are palliative tricks. To, to, to be able to implant a, a non-anatomic implant pr prosthesis in, in the envelope, but now we have to address the real problem. We have to copy the anatomy, to reproduce the anatomy. It's, uh, it's, it seems evident, but it's, it's what's not so easy to obtain in the, in the past decade. And do you think uh, a CT is advantages over an MRI or which one is better? Well, the, the, the CT is much easier to use uh, on the industrial point of view because you need to move to be able to move the image in industrial software. You know, um, uh, we use uh, SolidWorks software, for example, uh, and SolidWorks, it's, uh, it's an industrial software and we need to move the, the, the image in 3D and it's very difficult with MRI and the image are less accurate with MRI. So uh, it's much better with CT, no discussion. The only difficult, uh, difficulty with the CT is that we don't see the cartridge. 
So uh, when we put the guides on the, um, around the femur, we have on the, on the, the area with the palpators, we have to remove the, the cartilage. And we are working on that. And probably uh, our expectation is that in the future, robotic surgery will be able to be merged with custom implants. And if we have reliable robotics, it will solve the surgical technique problems. And if we have a custom implant, it will solve the design problem. So if we merge the two technology, I think we have solved a lot of problem in our job. Thank you for that. The other question is, do we have level one data, level one studies to compare customized TK with standard TK? No, no, no not yet, uh, because, um, you know, we have the CE mark, the, the implant is CE mark only the, pre, the since uh, August 2018. Uh, so we have, uh, we are actually working on the 2018 uh, cohort study. We are soon going to publish it. Uh, and we are going to launch a prospective randomized study to compare the custom versus the attune versus the persona all cemented PS. Now we have all the approval from the ethical committees. And so we are probably beginning this study in, um, in uh, January, in next January. And uh, what we have now is only cohort study. So, well, it's, uh, it has limitation. Uh, we are quite happy that we, it seems that the, the, uh, our, you know, the, the, the mean forgotten John score and Oxford uh, knee score is a little bit better than what we have previously published in other series. But as you said, we need to compare. Uh, we need uh, to have a level one uh, analysis. The fourth and final question before we wind up is, we can call a customized TK as a mechanically uh, kinematic alignment TK, isn't it? It's, it's a, it's, yes, but it's a customized kinematic alignment because of course, we reproduce the native alignment. So it's a sort of kinematic alignment, but the, the implant is adapted to that, is designed for that. So, so it's a, a custom kinematic. We call that the origin alignment because the prosthesis name is origin prosthesis. So we call it the origin alignment. I think that's all the questions we have. We should thank you for a fantastic lecture and a fantastic session as well. It was lovely listening to you and I hope we have more a lecture from your side when you have time later on. My pleasure. It's uh, don't hesitate to call me back. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very bye much. Bye bye. Bye bye.